Good morning, folks. Get, Good morning. get my uh, tablet ready to go. Take it for uh, writing notes. All right. So we're in, we're going to move on from aromatics today and start talking about carbonyls. And that's probably going to be the the bulk of what we cover the rest of this quarter is going to be centered around carbonyls. Um, so we're going to start with aldehydes and ketones, uh, and then we'll move into the carboxylic acid derivatives. So carboxylic acids, uh, acid anhydrides, acyl chlorides, amides, and I'm missing one more, esters. Um, those are all considered the same class of, of carbonyl compounds. So we'll talk about that in, um, in a little bit. We'll start with some um, some review here. And the students that ask these questions aren't here right now, so we'll save these questions for another time. Um, this is also the one year anniversary of one of my favorite quiz submissions of all time. Um, I got this last year um, on uh, the same quiz you guys took last week, uh, and it just made me think it looks a little bit like the scribblings of a, of a crazy person. Um, in particular, it made me think of Charlie. Um, but I actually don't mind this submission as a quiz submission, because at the very least, I can follow what their logic was. Um, and so, and as you guys know, if I can see what your logic was, I can give you more partial credit. Um, so it's never a bad idea to give me a, a um, uh, an idea of what you were thinking. Maybe not quite so intimate to look into your into your brain as this one, but then again, I did like it enough that I'm still showing it a year later. So, all right, let's. Um, here are a couple of the reactions. that we um that we went over briefly we didn't go over their mechanisms um so let's talk a little bit about how these reactions would go we have an idea of what the first step would be for a um we would that first step is going to be a nitration right we're going to add a nitro group Then the second step, if, we, if you add zinc in an acidic environment, that is a reducing environment. Because if you put a metal with something that's got lots of um, oxygen bonds, you are likely going to remove some of those oxygen bonds. So if we, if we wind up adding a nitro group, it's going to go in the ortho positions to the methyl, because the methyl is activating. So our first steps here would look like, our first step would look like the second step and actually two and three are part of the same reaction, is we're going to reduce one of these functional groups. Thing is, none of these functional groups really, only one of these functional groups really can be reduced easily. The only functional group that can be reduced is that NO2 that we just added. So this is that reaction that turns a nitro group into an amine. In an acidic environment, if you've got a, um, a reducing agent like a reactive metal, so zinc is commonly used, but um, there are lots of other metals that would cause this reaction to happen. After step two, the only thing that's going to change is we swap that NO2 for an NH2.
right? And so that's the reaction that we didn't we didn't spend that much time talking about or practicing with um, because it, it doesn't actually do any substitution on the aromatic ring itself. It just modifies the existing functional groups that are already on the aromatic ring. Uh, zoom in on this one a little bit so we can, so I have more room to draw. Step one here is a Friedel Crafts acylation, right? We've got an acid chloride with a Lewis acid. We're going to replace a hydrogen with a with the carbonyl carbon. So there's our two methyls still there. And then, and another three carbons, one, two, three. From there, just the same way that the zinc and the acid up above was a reducing agent that turned our nitro group into an amine, we're going to do the exact same thing except zinc. It is a zinc uh, mercury alloy that you need to, to be the reactant here. It's not zinc or mercury. It's it really, you need both of them. Um, but what this is going to do, this is also going to reduce the same compound. We have the same issue. There's only really one place that we can reduce, and that's that carbonyl. So this takes that um, ketone. If you have a ketone in a benzylic position, then this reaction will take that ketone and just turn it into an alkyl group. So we'll wind up with One, two, three, four. Right, so this is a way that we can add an alkyl group in a very specific place. And then um, by adding an acyl group with the carbonyl and then reducing the carbonyl. All right, again, for C, we know what step one is going to do. Step one is going to take, is going to add a methyl group. And we have an ortho para director here. So we'll get two products. We'll get a product that adds a methyl to the ortho position. And we'll get the product that adds a methyl to the para position. So we'll get isopropyl para isopropyl toluene and we'll we'll get ortho isopropyl toluene. Anybody remember what a strong oxidizing agent will do? To alkyl groups, Cody. I think you're gonna make a carboxylic acid or something. Yeah, this was that reaction that if you have any benzylic hydrogens, it'll basically chop off the rest of the group and turn it into a benzoic acid. Um, and so, and if you have it in two places, you're gonna turn both of them into a carboxylic acid. So wind up with. I didn't give myself enough room there. Same compound as as uh, we'd get from the, the one right above. It just flipped over because that's where I had room to draw the, the acid group.
And if I'm remembering correctly, this is another one of those um, substituted benzenes that has a common name. Um, actually, both of these have the same common name. I believe that this is phthalic acid. And it's phthalic P H T H A L I C. And probably need to give it a No, it's giving issues. PH, TH. Yeah. So I don't know why Moldview wasn't pulling it up. This would be orthophthalic acid, the structure that's shown here. You could have metaphthalic acid or paraphthalic acid as well. And how about last case here? We're adding in methyl group again, right? We're gonna add it in the ortho and para position. So we're gonna get a combination of, I know what I can do to give myself more space. Look at that. So if we add the Methyl in the ortho position, we'll get that compound. We add it in the para position. We get that compound. In either case, Excess and bromosexinamide, that's our compound that preferentially brominates in the benzylic position, right? So any hydrogens in the benzylic position get replaced with a bromine. So we're not going to do anything to the T-butyl group because it doesn't have any hydrogens that can be replaced. Remember, it's, it's only going to, to brominate in spots that have resonance stabilization. So because the benzylic carbon on the T-butyl group doesn't have any hydrogens to be replaced, it won't react. The methyl, on the other hand, is has three hydrogens that can be replaced that are all resonance stabilized. So we'll replace all of the carbons, all of the hydrogens, excuse me, I just drew the same one again. All right, so those are the three main reactions that we have to modify functional groups that are already on a benzene ring. We can reduce a nitro group to an amine. We can reduce a carbonyl, a benzylic carbonyl, to an sp3 carbon. And we can oxidize benzylic carbons to carboxylic acids and we can brominate benzylic carbons. Right? And so those, those reactions, those four reactions in general, um, only occur reliably 
um, when you have something in the benzylic position. So they're not going to react with the entire molecule. So that makes them fairly selective. All right, so that gets us through the end of 17. Um, I know we didn't spend a ton of time on these last four reactions, but we've seen some of them before, and we're not going to be tested on the mechanisms for any of them. The mechanisms you're going to be tested on are the um, electrophilic aromatic substitution, nucleophilic aromatic substitution, and that elimination addition where we made the benzyne intermediate. All right, so those are the three new mechanisms we added last chapter. All right, so I know it's kind of an open-ended question, but does anybody want um, have any questions about the stuff from, from chapter 17, those mechanisms or those reactions we just went over? Um, and just, we have a few more people here. Thought I'd address how does water inside electronics cause shorts before we move on. Um, it is kind of due to polarity redirecting electricity. Basically, and this is a good life skill for you to have to understand how electricity works a little bit so that you don't you know, electrocute yourself. Um, things short out when you give them a path of less resistance. So you can think of the current in a, an electrical circuit as, move, as water moving downhill that's being used to turn a water wheel. If you have water moving downhill that's being used to turn a water, water wheel, but you give that water a faster route to get downhill, it'll skip the water wheel. And it'll go downhill and go around your water wheel and ignore it. That's what a short basically is. If you give the electrons from a battery a faster route to go, rather than going through the whole circuit and powering a light, light bulb or whatever you have your, your circuit doing, it'll just go straight from the positive end of the battery or the negative end of the battery to the positive end of the battery. And you just wind up with all of your electrons from your battery moving downhill really fast and not powering anything. And the downside to that is that's also usually um, generates a lot of heat because you still will have some resistance and that resistance will cause to heat up. And so you have the tendency to fry your entire circuit because you can melt things or cause things to explode if you do it too quickly. Um, which is one of the reasons why if the um i don't no idea what they're what they're doing for screening for uh, airport security these days um because it's been you know a year since any of us have been in on a plane at least me um but the way that they screen for security it really has no impact on the, on your airplane security because all it takes is one laptop battery shorted out the right way and you can blow up the entire plane um because those laptop batteries, those lithium ion batteries have a ton of electricity, a ton of power in them. And if you short it and have allow all of that to go through at once, you can wind up with the battery overloading and exploding. Um, so you need to be careful not to short things out. And that just basically means um, don't give the electricity a better way to go. And that's all water does. Water just allows electricity to flow through the water instead of through the wires. Um, if you want an idea of just how fast this can happen, you, you know, you can actually start a um, campfire with a gum wrapper and a AA battery. You take a, a metallic gum wrapper and twist it so that the metal is on the outside and you touch it to both ends of a AA battery, it'll actually generate enough current going through the gum wrapper that the gum wrapper will catch on fire. So you can actually use that as a fire starter. Um, it's not quite as good as steel wool with a nine volt battery, but it's almost as good. Steel wool with a nine volt battery is kind of fun, but it will light things on fire if you're not careful. Uh, 
Um, and this is, it's also why usually if you can dry, if you don't fully melt things in your circuit, drying everything out will allow your, your phone or whatever to start working again. Um, if you turn off your phone as soon as you drop it in water, so it doesn't have time to melt anything and dry it out and remove all that water, you can go back to your circuit acting the way it's supposed to. Anyway, brief digression about electrical circuits. I don't know very much about that. Bruce and Kathy are better person, people to ask about that. But I know just enough to be dangerous, literally in this case. All right. Um, last year, somebody asked questions of, are there any additional resources to help you through the online or the uh, computational labs? Um, there are tutorials and things, and there are manuals for games and for um, Macmill PLT. I don't know that I would say that they're going to help you more than than watching the videos that we've recorded and asking questions in lab. Um, because typically the way tutorials work is it's going to walk you through running calculations the same way that I'm walking you through running calculations. So it's you're you're adding extra steps um, that make you more comfortable with it, but it's also increasing your workload. Um, be unlikely that you'll be able to find anything that will directly help you um, run these jobs. That said, you can find if you Google a specific error, if you type in games with two S's and then copy and paste the error message you're getting, there's a good chance you'll be able to find something where they will walk you, not walk you through, well, there will explain what that error actually means. So if I'm not around to interpret the error messages from games, you can always try that. And there's lots of online forums and the games manual itself is not super easy to read, but it does have a lot of information about those error codes. Um, and you can tell if you get enough of those error codes, you will start to see that there are um, there were a lot of different people of varying senses of humor that developed games over a long period of time because some of them have a sense of humor and some don't. Um, sometimes the error message will give you something like from um, 2001 Space Odyssey, where if, if you uh, give it the wrong input, you'll get a message back from games that says, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that. Um, and so you'll get you'll get various um, little Easter eggs like that. But at the same time, um, that's not super helpful for telling you what you actually did wrong. So uh, Google is your friend. Just make sure you're including the entire text of the um, of the error message and you might be able to figure stuff out that way or send me an email, screenshot it, send me an email and I can probably help you out. All right. Do any of you guys have any specific questions about the lab from Tuesday so far? Everybody finished lab on Tuesday. Oh, go ahead, Cody. Um, I was going to ask for a little bit more details about making the potential energy surface. OK. So let me open up Excel. Um, so what we're going to do make the potential energy surface is we're basically you're going to take your um your various energies that you get out and you're just going to look at the energy of the reactants and call that energy zero basically and so if you have reactants then you have your transition state then you had your products So reactants, we had ethylene, ethylene, that's Canadian ethylene, um, and water, we had, we had numbers for each of those. They were in heart trees, so they were, you know, not numbers that made a lot of sense to us, but we had energies for each of those. And then we had energies for transition state, and our product was ethanol.
Um, so do you have your, I want to get uh, relatively, here, I'll open up my old files here. So let's look at the, we'll look at the water, the uh, ROHF. So when I plug this in, I got for ethylene, I got neg negative 78.0431 for ethylene. And then for water, Sorry, Sean, is ethylene and ethene the same thing? Yes, sorry, ethylene's just oh, okay. the, um, the common name for it. Okay. Uh, water, I got negative 76.0312. And your numbers might not match mine exactly, but they're, they should be pretty close. Um, if we're gonna call these this zero, what we want to for our, to see what the numbers look like for a potential energy surface, we're just going to do transition state minus the react the sum of the reactants. And we're going to do products minus the sum of the reactants. So, just going to add a get negative one fifty four point oh seven four three. And then if I look at the transition state and plug that energy in, negative 153.9560. And might as well do ethanol while we're at it. A 154.0960. Right, so these numbers don't look all that different from each other because we're in hard trees right now and hard trees are really, really large energy units. So being off by a couple hundredths of a hard tree is a big amount in terms of um, kilojoules per mole. Um, so if we want to look at the net difference between these, we're just going to look at each of them relative to the sum of the products. So this is, we'll put net and we'll add, I think that the unit for Hartree is just a capital H. And we'll, we're going to convert that into net in kilojoules per mole. Right, so I'm or trying to keep this organized so I know what everything is, but the individual, the math steps are really straightforward. It's just gonna be either adding things up or products minus reactants. So products or reactants minus themselves, is always where we are now minus the initial. And so my formula that I plugged in here is just the transition state energy minus the sum of the reactants. And the formula that I plugged in over here for the products, it's just the products minus the sum of the reactants. All right, so this gives us a rough idea. It doesn't give us any context. We don't really know what heart trees, you know, we don't have any, any feeling for how big a heart tree is other than it's big, but we know we're going uphill in energy, a certain amount of uh, energy relative to the reactants. And then we're gonna go downhill in energy to get to the products. And if we want to put that in kilojoules per mole, we can look up a kilojoules per mole um, conversion. Put 
course, it helps with my keyboard types. So one heart tree is 2625. Um, I'm assuming uh, this is a NIST website, so we can trust that. And it's got the right conversion for kcals per mole. So 2625.5 kilojoules is one heart tree. So if we want to put our potential energy surface in kilojoules per mole, we would just take these numbers and we would multiply by 2625.5. And that tells us now that that gives us some context. You still might not know exactly how big or small these are. Well, that's why I was not typing into my search bar. I was chatting it to you guys. Um, so just to give you context, if you want a reaction to happen at room temperature, then you want your your transition state needs to be around 100 kilojoules per mole or lower. So this is a relatively big transition state energy. Um, and we could actually take this um, energy for the entire reaction, the negative 56.97. Um, we could actually use that to get an equilibrium constant for this, right? Remember our equilibrium expression that um, allowed us to go from delta G to equilibrium constant was K equals E, the negative delta G over RT. You guys remember that equation from Gen Chem, at least somewhat? We can actually plug in our reaction energy that we just calculated in for delta G. We make the, if we make the assumption that um, what we really calculated was the enthalpy, not the entropy. We didn't take entropy into account. But for the most part, entropy is a fairly insignificant um, contributor to, to a lot of these reactions. So to get a rough idea of what the equilibrium constant would look like, we can just plug the energy we just calculated, that 56 kilojoules per mole, we can plug it in for delta G and get an idea of what K is, which is kind of cool. Um, and that's that kind of ties this to this is how we would actually link what we're doing in lab right now to what we could actually measure in an actual wet lab is this allows us to predict ahead of time what the equilibrium constant should be, at least roughly. All right, so then that would just that would be the math behind this, which is all really straightforward, right? You just take the energies we calculated, put them in the right units, do products minus reactants or transition state minus reactants. If we want to turn that into a potential energy surface, you can make it look really fancy, but really all you need to do is, is plug in um, a reaction coordinate that we're going to use for our X, and we can plug in energy for our Y. So we, if we say that the reactants are one, the transition state is two, and the products are three, is zero, 310.6, and negative 56.57.0, we can just do a scatter plot. We select data, we say, okay, my X values that I kind of made up arbitrarily because we're just representing the reaction coordinate there. There is a rough idea of what your, your potential energy surface looks like. And we don't really care about the X axis. So we could clean that up by deleting that. Um, and we could, you know, you would want to fill in the Y axis here so you know what you look like. And you can make it look fancier if you want. You could do things like um, if we added a couple other points to make it look to have 1.5, and we call that zero as well. And then we could add 
2.5 and call that 310.6 as well. It starts looking more like what we'd see in a um, in a textbook. That starts looking a little fancier if you do it that way. Just and all, all I'm really doing is putting two points in for each of these, um, just to make it so instead of having just a point here, then up, then down, just so it gives you that little flat area to indicate that that's what's what we call a stationary point. A stationary point is either a local minimum or a local maximum. Um, but you don't even really need to go that far if you don't want to for this one. You can just plot the numbers in there. And then if we wanted to add, so if this was our ROHF, if we had our MO62X, numbers, we would do the exact same thing. We would do plug in your reactant numbers. So if this was ROHF, we could keep this all labeled separately. Again, if you really wanted to make it look fancy, play around with the borders, then we do the exact same thing down here. We're just going to plug in different numbers for MO6 2x. You might have to adjust your formulas a little bit, but um, and then if when we want to plot these on the same graph, we would just go and add another series here, which would not be too tricky to do. I just start pulling out the energy. So for water, negative 76, 3943, and ethylene, negative 78.5461. You notice that they're significantly different than the numbers we got for ROHF. Because we're using different calculation method, we're going to get different numbers here. And that's what's going to give us a different transitions or different potential energy surface as well. And just because now that I've started, I can't stop halfway through this. Transition state energy, negative 154.8567. And ethanol energy. negative 154.9714. So now we get numbers that look a little bit a little bit different than up above. Two nineteen point eight. And so to plot those on the same graph, we would just go back to select data. We would add another series. We pick our X values. 
pick our MO6 numbers for our Y values. And we get two potential energy um, surfaces on the same set of axes that way. I just, I know you guys have probably all seen that before, but it's been a while since we played with Excel. Um, so brief review how to add two series to the same, the same chart. And this also illustrates why we use different methods. We know that this is a reaction that should happen at room temperature, right? We know that this is one of the first reactions we learned. When we learned, we learned addition reactions, we know that hydration of alkenes is a downhill reaction that should happen relatively quickly around room temperature. So this first data set where we had that said um, our transition state was 300 kilojoules per mole, that can't be a very good accurate number there because we know this reaction happens at room temperature. So we use a slight, a better method that, that calculates energies a little bit better um, for organic reactions. And we get something that looks a lot closer to what we would expect. We get something that um, gives us a transition state energy of 200 kilojoules per mole instead of instead of 300 kilojoules per mole, which is still a little high, but considering we're not taking into account any solvent, solvent effects, we're just treating this as though this is happening in the gas phase, this might be a reasonable number. Um, and if we actually had the computational power to let the MO6 um, functional do the geometry optimization, we might get better numbers even, but we don't have the um, you guys don't have the expertise or the computational power to do that. So this is just to illustrate that picking the right functional will give you numbers that reflect reality a little bit better. All right, so yours doesn't need to look this, um, this way exactly. You do want to probably keep your numbers organized so you're not mixing in your your MO6 numbers with your RHF numbers. Um, so, and you can have it organized however you like though. You just need to make sure you're mi not mixing them up, and that you're getting. And if you get wildly, if you get a number that says that's um, tens of thousands of kilojoules per mole for your transition state energy or any, even anything over 500 kilojoules per mole, you probably don't have the right geometry. You probably wanna double check that. All right, so this for, for your reasonableness check, this is about what your number, your numbers will look a little bit different potentially, but they're gonna be about like this. Okay. Any other lab questions at this point? All right, let's take a quick break. Um, let's come back at five to nine and we will start covering uh, aldehydes and ketones.
All right. Let's get back to it. Um, so I have here a list of figures of all of the different types of carbonyls. Um, these are the most common carbonyl functional groups. They're not the only ones, there's others out there. These are the ones we care about the most because they're the most common. Um, and as I mentioned, we're going to spend a fair bit of time talking about carbonyls now. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so generally speaking, carbonyl functional groups are, are grouped into two classes. And it's general, it's based mostly on the oxidation state of the carbonyl carbon. So if, you're, if your carbonyl carbon has two carbon oxygen bonds or two electronegative bonds, um, it's a class one, or sorry, it's a class two carbonyl. Class one carbonyls are attached to a good leaving group. So our class one carbonyls are the ones that are boxed in red here. If you look at these, each of them has a pretty good leaving group attached to the carbonyl carbon. So if you can imagine breaking off um, each of these, um, each of these leaving groups from the carbonyl carbon, they're all fairly good leaving groups. Hydroxide's a decent leaving group. Um, and a uh, carboxylate anion is a really good leaving group. I mean, some of them are better than others. And they add halogen, an acyl halide has a much better leaving group than an OH group. But they're all better leaving groups than, say, a hydrogen, a hydride, or a, um, or a carbon. So class one carbonyls, that means we can actually convert back and forth between these all fairly easily because if you've got a good leaving group and the carbonyl carbon has a good partial positive charge on it, a nucleophilic substitution is actually really easy to do for all of these class one carbonyls. Um, if you take any one of these class one carbonyl groups and you expose it to a strong base or a good nucleophile, you can get the reaction to go through a substitution reaction. You can convert back and forth between these various um, functional groups fairly easily because just by switching out one leaving group for a different leaving group. All right, so it really does look a lot like an SN1 or an SN2 reaction. However, class two carbonyls are the ones we're going to look at first. And class two carbonyls, which are basically limited to aldehydes and ketones. Aldehydes and ketones are their own category of carbonyl compounds because they don't have a, a good leaving group. And therefore, they don't go through substitution reactions. They're more likely to go through addition reactions. Um, and we saw that when we talked about making alcohols last quarter, right? When we went through our alcohols chapter, we, we said, okay, if you take an aldehyde and you expose it to a hydride source, you're going to break the carbonyl bond and you're going to be left with an alcohol. You guys remember that? Um, anytime you've, you have a strong nucleophile and you expose it to an aldehyde or a ketone, you're going to wind up adding it to the carbonyl carbon, and you break the carbon-oxygen pi bond. Uh, and so that's what we're going to see is, is the predominant reaction for class two carbonyls. Most of them are going to be um, addition reactions, where we're going to break that carbon-oxygen pi bond. Um, and so the, the only difference between aldehydes and ketones, just as a review, is aldehydes are at the are on a primary carbon. So you have one R group attached to the carbonyl carbon, and then you have a hydrogen on the other side. 
Um, and a ketone has two R groups attached. So it's a, it's a secondary carbon that is part of the, that is the uh, carbon, the carbonyl carbon is a secondary carbon if it's a ketone. Um, they're slightly different as far as how they react, which is why they're two, considered two different functional groups. Um, and they show up differently in the body as well. Um, if you, if you've ever had a hangover before, um, that's mostly due to the fact that as your body breaks down ethanol and methanol, it produces aldehydes. So you actually make ethanaldehyde and, and formaldehyde um, as your body breaks down ethanol and methanol. Um, but your body, your body can't digest secondary alcohols as well as primary alcohols. And so your body doesn't make ketones as it's breaking those down. Your body makes ketones when it breaks down fats. If your body, if you don't have any, any uh, carbohydrates around in your body, um, your, your body starts running out of the necessary substrates to go through the electron transport chain, to go through oxidative phosphorylation or aerobic respiration. Um, and so what happens is your body starts making ketones as a way to sort of drive equilibrium towards still making more ATP. So if you, anybody who's um, been on a, um, a Atkins diet or keto diet for long enough that they start going into ketosis, um, that's really, that's the point where your body is burning fat and has a shortage of carbohydrates to the point where your body will start making ketones like acetone, um, which is not particularly good for you long term. It can help you lose weight in the short term. Um, but anybody who's been on a keto diet for like years and years, um, it's really bad for your liver um, to be in ketosis for, a, for an extended period of time. Um, so you just have to, to pay attention to that. Those fad diets can be can help you lose weight, which can be healthy for you, but at the same time, they can also be wrecking your kidneys or your liver. Um, here's some common aldehyde and ketone compounds that we see in everyday life. These ones in the top are all um, different flavorings. So vanillin, cinnamaldehyde, carvone, and benzaldehyde. Um, are all different class two carbonyls we see naturally occurring. Um, almond extract is almost exclusively benzaldehyde, which is one of the reasons why it's so easy to make things like um, taste like almonds with a little bit of almond extract. You don't actually need to use um, whole almonds to get almond flavoring because benzaldehyde is really easy to synthesize. It's a really simple molecule. So synthetic almond flavoring is actually pretty close to the real deal. And same with vanilla. Vanillin is synthetic, uh, is, can be made in a lab fairly easily. And so if you buy um, vanilla flavoring, if, instead of buying like, um, if you buy the cheap vanilla extract, it's usually lab made vanillin with some, with some caramel coloring and some alcohol added to it. So Sean, about vanilla flavor, I saw recently someone was saying that it's from like the anal glands of, um, God, what are those animals that chew on wood? Beavers. Um, huh? Beavers. Beavers. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. Yeah. Is, do you know anything about that? Um, there, I don't know anything specifically about that, but I do know that there are a lot of, of um, animals and plants that produce villain. That's actually why sugar pines smell like they do is, um, is they produce small amounts of vanillin in their pine cones and in their sap. Um, so sugar pines smell like a bakery because they're producing small amounts of vanillin. Hmm. Um, so a lot of these do show up in other places. I don't think that the amount in sugar pines is worth like harvesting. They don't make that much compared to like vanilla beans. Um, and you certainly can see them in uh in various animal glands as well depending on what the animal is especially as they use um different animals use different um different glands for marking territory and things like that they're going to make 
certain very distinct smelling compounds as a way of marking their territories. You know, tigers do the same thing um, when they spray all over the place and, and house cats for that matter. If you've ever had a, a male house cat that sprayed, um, they're doing the same thing, um, marking territory with some of these really fragrant compounds. Um, we don't usually think of the ones that cats use as smelling pleasant, but I could, I could believe it of beavers um, potentially that that might be the case. Um, down in the bottom right, there's formaldehyde and acetone. Um, those are the common named ones. We can actually name them. Their IUPAC names um, are actually just as, as simple as some of the others. Um, with ketones, you name ketones just by adding the suffix "-one", O-N-E. So you treat it like you're naming an alcohol. And then you add, instead of adding O-L at the end, you add O-N-E. So acetone, technically, if it was, um, if we're naming the IUPAC name for acetone, it would be propanone. And we don't really need a number on that one because you can only have your a ketone in one place on a propyl um, on a uh, three carbon long chain, right? Because if it was uh, at either end of the chain, it would not be a ketone, it would be an aldehyde. And in aldehydes, we name by, instead of adding OL to the end, you add AL. And so methanol would be CH3OH, would be the alcohol. Methanol would be the IUPAC name for formaldehyde. Um, or if you want to be even more specific and don't mind doing more writing, you can name it methanaldehyde. AL is short for aldehyde. So you can actually write that in. It wouldn't be considered wrong to say methanaldehyde. Um, it's just, it's more specific, but considering how easy it would be to mix up methanol and methanol, um, it's not a bad idea to write, to write methanaldehyde or say it especially. Um, and we do see a lot of um, a lot of steroids and a lot of hormones um, that are ketones. In fact, that's one of the reasons that hormones um, have that root name is a lot of them are ketones. So testosterone, um, progesterone. I'm trying to think of the one that's based A-N-D-R-O and andro and uh, that's androgen, I think. Um, but you do see a, a significant number of, of hormones that are also ketones as well. They show up a lot in, in the body. Um, they're, you know, it's, it's so, alcohols and aldehydes and ketones are such a, a common functional group in general. It's hard to make generalizations like all ketones are hormones or, or things like that because a lot of ketones can be other um, can be medications that work in the brain. There's certain um, neurotransmitters that have ketones associated with them. Um, so it's, it's not a hard and fast rule that all ketones in the body have to be hormones. Um, but it, it is common, you commonly see them in these cholesterol based derivatives. Um, here's the the uh, list for how we name class one and class two uh, carbonyl or class two carbonyls anyway. Uh, if it's an aldehyde, you add AL. If it's a, um, and if it's directly attached to a cyclic ring, we just add, we call it a carbaldehyde. So cyclohexane carbaldehyde would be the name for this compound here. But for the most part, you're just going to treat it like naming an alcohol and you're going to name it um, just with AL instead of OL. And if it's a ketone, it's O-N-E. So own instead of O-L. Uh, and the other key is we're looking for the parent molecule, the longest carbon chain that has the functional group as part of it. 
as part of that carbon chain. So these ones where we've got an aldehyde directly attached to a carbon chain, that's those ones are kind of the exception because we're not the longest continuous carbon chain that has the aldehyde is only one carbon long. Uh, and so that's why it has a separate way of naming those. It's cyclohexane carbaldehyde is a separate nomenclature system. It's not cyclohexane hexan aldehyde because that would imply that your aldehyde is part of the cyclohexyl group, which it's not. It's attached to the cyclohexane, but the aldehyde is not on that same chain. In fact, an aldehyde can't be part of a chain, right? Part of a cyclic structure because it has to be a primary carbon to be an aldehyde. However, you can have a ketone can be part of a cyclo of a cyclo group, right? And so we would just name this cyclohexanone. I just like if it was an OH that was attached, it'd be cyclohexanol. All right, and so here's the, the page um, with the official directions for ketones. Um, and the numbering system, and this is just a term that, that gets used in the textbook that I thought I'd, I'd define. Um, the locant is, is what is the number basically, is the, where you're telling it where something is attached. Um, that's the official name for it. I don't know why they don't just call it the number. Um, that the locant gives you the location of the functional group. And so you can put the three in front of the whole thing, just like with alcohols, put the three in front of the whole thing or right before the O-N-E. Um, the old school way of naming these is kind of like ethers where you would just name both sides of it. So for instance, if you had a, a ketone where you had an ethyl group on one side of the ketone and a propyl group on the other, you would name it ethyl propyl ketone. Um, if you had an ethyl group on both sides, it would be diethyl ketone. Or a really common solvent that's used that you can buy um, at hardware stores um, is methyl ethyl ketone, MEK. If you've done any work with uh, finishing or painting, you've probably heard of MEK. Um, which stands for methyl ethyl ketone, which the better name for methyl ethyl ketone is butanone. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so not the aldehydes are a little trickier to name because they have that weird case where you can have an aldehyde attached to a, a cyclohexyl group or a cycloalkyl group um, where we have to use that carbaldehyde name. Um, ketones are fairly straightforward, other than sometimes they're used, they're named with this old school naming convention. So let's practice. It's been a while since we've done some nomenclature practice, right? And some of these are already drawn, written on there. Let me get rid of those. Take a few seconds, try and write names for these.
All right, let's start with A. So we've got an aldehyde. Because we have carbonyl at the end of a carbon chain. And drawing the structure with the, the hydrogen explicitly shown is, is fairly common, even though it's not technically a skeletal structure then. Um, but it does it makes it a lot more obvious when you're dealing with a aldehyde. If you were drawing an aldehyde without showing that hydrogen explicitly, it would look something like that, which is a little bit trickier to see what you're dealing with. It just it looks a little bit funnier. Um, so freak, it's very, very common to write in the hydrogen, even though it's not technically required. So we've got an aldehyde, our longest continuous carbon chain with the aldehyde is one, two, three, four, five, six carbons long. So our base molecule is going to be hexanal. And then we've got two, two, dimethyl, was that five, five, dibromo, hexanal. Or if you're saying it out loud and you want to make sure you're not misheard, it's not wrong to say hexanaldehyde. We're looking at B, our longest continuous carbon chain that has the carbonyl on it is also six carbons, but the carbonyl is not at the end of the carbon chain, which makes this hexanone. And then we have and that's two hexanone. You have to specify where the carbonyl is because you could have three hexanone as well, right? And then we have three methyls attached. So three, four, five, trimethyl. two hexanone, and then we do have two stereo centers in there as well. So we would want to specify R versus S for each of those. So if I zoom in so that we can have enough room to right there, I'll zoom out in a second and that name will be in the right spot again. For carbon three, we've got priority one, priority two, priority three. So it's counterclockwise, but the hydrogen is sticking out towards us, which means that we had to step through the board and look backwards. So it actually would be an R. Oops, undo, wanted that. For carbon four, our highest priority is going to be towards the ketone, 
then the isopropyl group, then the methyl. So that would be clockwise, except again, hydrogen is sticking out towards us. We have to step into the board and look backward. So 4S. So our full name for B, the 3R4S345 trimethyl 2-hexanone. So again, nothing we haven't seen before. We're just reviewing because it's been a while since we've had to do R and S. Nice thing about aromatics, right? It's all of your carbons on the ben on the benzene ring are all sp2, so there's no R and S. Questions so far? So C is going to be a cyclohexa, cyclopentanone. And just like with alcohols, wherever our primary functional group is attached is going to be carbon one if it's on a um, cyclo group. So we don't need to specify one cyclopentanone. We just would need to specify two, two, four, no, five, five. Tetra methyl cyclopentanol. D and E are simpler, but they're still worth looking at because there are some of the special cases. For D, we need to find the longest continuous carbon chain that starts with the aldehyde. Even though that's not the longest continuous carbon chain full stop, it's the longest continuous carbon chain that has the aldehyde. So that makes it one, two, three, four, five, makes it a pentanal. It's just going to be a two propyl pentanal. And luckily, we don't have to establish R versus S because that middle carbon is supposed to be pointing at the carbon, not the bond, has two propyl groups attached to it. So it has two identical substituents. So we don't need to worry about R versus S. You had a question about D. E. Yeah. What if you had another aldehyde on that propyl group? That's a good question. Um, you would probably name it. I don't know if you would name it as a diol. That's what we would normally do. Like if we had two alkenes, we name it as a diene. If we had two alcohols, we would name it as a diol. I don't know about diol. Um, it might be. In fact, for all I know, that's where the, um, the name of the soap comes from. Um, but I, I would need to look to see what the, the actual, we, we won't usually see that. Seeing two aldehydes on the same compound is going to be pretty unusual. Um, but 
if I had to guess, it probably would be a dial. You would name one end of your carbon chain would start with one aldehyde, the end in the carbon chain would end in the other aldehyde, and then you would just name whatever else is attached to it as a substitute as a um, branch. Um, but I don't know that for sure. Last but not least, we have one of our exceptions for um, aldehydes is if you had an aldehyde directly attached to a carbon chain, or sorry, to a carbon ring, we use that carbaldehyde term. So this would be cyclobutane carbaldehyde. Right. That's and that's really the one exception that doesn't follow our normal rules is when you have an aldehyde attached to a carbon ring. Um, if it was a ketone attached to a carbon ring, we would just name the cyclo the cycloalkyl group as a branch the way we we would with an alcohol. Um, so, for instance, if we had this compound. Probably I, the name would just be cyclobutyl ethanone. But if it's an aldehyde attached, we use this carbaldehyde term. All right, so here's some reverse practice. I always found this to be a lot easier for me, at least because reading through the name will remind you of what the various rules are you need to pay attention to. Um, so let's do the, let's do A since it's the most complicated and then we'll keep going. So for each of these start by by drawing your, your parent molecule, which in this case is the cyclohexanone. Cyclohexyl, adding a ketone to, to it. Then you've got an 3,3-dibromo. So that can't be what the S is referring to, right? Because we have two bromines are attached to the same carbon. So that's not going to be the where we care about the stereochemistry. So carbon one, carbon one is where the ketone is attached to three. So bromine, bromine. And last but not least, We have four ethyl, and we want the four ethyl to be S. And so my approach when you're trying to draw something with the right stereochemistry is to just pick one option and draw it and figure out if you drew the R or the S. If you drew the wrong one, just switch. So if we start by drawing the ethyl pointing out towards us, Then we assign priority. Our priority would go one would be the side with the bromines, two would be the side, the other part of the ring, three would be the ethyl. And the hydrogen is priority four facing into the board already. One to two to three, it's counterclockwise, right? So we already drew, we got the S, we guessed right on the first one. If we got the wrong um, stereoisomer, the well, first time we drew it, we would just switch this from being a wedge to dashes.
All right, so again, as usual, break it down your parent molecule and then just start slowly adding all the branches. Questions on this? Okay. Sometimes it's nice to go back and review nomenclature because it's very straightforward now that we know the basic rules, right? Um, so here are some, some reactions where we've seen aldehydes show up previously. Um, we've seen aldehydes as a way, are we, a way to make aldehydes um, from primary alcohols. You can make aldehydes by using these two mild oxidation methods. Actually, there's three of them. Those are all, all reactions that will make an aldehyde from a primary alcohol. And we saw a couple, if you have a terminal alkyne, there was another mild oxidation. It will take a terminal alkyne and turn it into um, an aldehyde. And so far, the only reaction that we've seen that that will um, generate ketones, actually, I don't think it's the only one. Um, and actually, this is in the context of, of making aldehydes, is if you have um, ozonolysis, sometimes an aldehyde is your is one of your products or both of your products, depending on the on the case. Right. So because remember, ozonolysis is just going to break break a carbon-carbon pi bond and replace it with, um, with a carbon-oxygen bond. And so we've, we've seen aldehydes show up a few times. We haven't specifically looked at the reactions that the aldehydes themselves go through. Um, the reactions that will make a ketone are actually a little bit easier because there's only um, if we're oxidizing a secondary alcohol, it's always going to stop at the ketone. Um, the problem with just doing oxidation of an of a primary alcohol is that it oxidized all the way to a carboxylic acid, right? And that's why we had to have those other PCC or um, various other options for the mild oxidation. We don't have to worry about that for ketones. If it's a secondary alcohol, you just throw it with some dichromate. Dichromate will oxidize it as far as it can and then stop, which is stops at the ketone. Um, ozonolysis will sometimes give you ketone products. Um, you can also, if you did acid catalyzed hydration of a terminal alkyne. Remember, acid catalyzed hydration starts by adding an OH to one side of a pi bond and a hydrogen to the other, but then it rearranged itself. So this is going back to section or to chapter nine when we first dealt with alkynes. Um, acid catalyzed hydration will will break one of the pi bonds, but not both of them. You add an OH to one group, one side, so you made that enol intermediate. The enol intermediate. looked like actually and then both of those were hydrogens that's supposed to be an oxygen there kind of gave my didn't give myself enough room So that would be the first product that you would get when you do acid catalyzed hydration. Um, and then it's going to rearrange itself into the ketone. 
that remember there was that term uh, enol keto tautomerization where it switches back and forth between a ketone and an enol and it favors making the ketone form. And then lastly, the one we just added was Friedel-Crafts acylation. Aromatic rings that are not too strongly deactivated will react with an acyl halide and a Lewis acid to produce a ketone. All right, so we have some experience with aldehydes and ketones as a product of other reactions. And we have some experience with aldehydes and ketones as reactants as well. Remember, a lot of our ways of making alcohols were to start with an aldehyde or a ketone and then reduce it. So let's look at a few of these reactions here. If we, if we had cyclohexanol and we wanted to make cyclohexanone, what kind of reaction would that be? Oxidation. It'd be an, an oxidation reaction. So that the easiest oxidation reaction is just expose it to dichromate or chromic acid, or even just write O in brackets. Is a shorthand to just say, and you oxidize it. That's not really as detailed as we want it to be, but you, there are several methods we could pick for oxidation at this point. Um, better would to be if you um, are, especially on a test and you're asked this question, then usually you wanna be more specific. And so you would say you know, Na, Na2Cr2O, O7, sodium dichromate is going to oxidize a secondary alcohol to a ketone. If we want to turn in a primary alcohol to an aldehyde, we had to use one of those more that's still an oxidation reaction, but we, we have to use one of the more gentle oxidation methods. So PCC. In dichloromethane. We'll give you that aldehyde. If we have a terminal alkyne and we want to turn it into a ketone, that puts this, the um, carbonyl on the more substituted carbon. So on this, the carbon that's one from the end. This is a really consistent way to make a ketone. And we just do the acid catalyzed hydration. Although this one, this version requires mercury as a as a uh, catalyst, because remember alkynes don't react quite the same as alkenes. Is that an H after mercury? No, sorry, that's a two plus. That's oh, a charge. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good question. The stylus is better than using my mouse, but it's still not as good as having a whiteboard. That's a little better. All 
All right, so the, and the rest of these are going to be more versions of the same, of the same reaction. Oh, if we wanted to, to um, make a, an aldehyde from the same molecule, we would have to use an anti-Markovnikov mechanism. So hydroboration oxidation would be our anti-Markovnikov hydration. If you think back to our addition reactions. Um, so if we took the same molecule as C and we expose it to BH3 followed by H2O2 and sodium hydroxide. Is that looking familiar? It's been a, a long time since we did Markovnikov versus anti-Markovnikov. Um, back when we first dealt with alkenes and alkynes. But if you want to add your oxygen in the less substituted carbon, you have to use the anti-Markovnikov addition, which is that hydroboration followed by the oxidation. My daughter is figuring out that if she has the uh, bag of dog treats, she can yell at the dog and the dog listens to her. And she really likes having something around here that she can order around. So I'm just listening to her yelling in the backyard about the dog. We start with the ring structure. And we don't end with the ring structure. Odds are we're doing something with ozonolysis. Right, because ozonolysis would break this up right in the middle. You get an aldehyde on one side and a ketone on the other. Because we're going to replace that double bond with a carbon with a carbonyl on um, in both cases. How would you name the product of E? Um I have to you, typically if you have two things that you would normally name as a suffix as the, the last part, one of them we will turn into a prefix. So if we had like an OH group, we would just instead of um and an aldehyde, we would name name it like an aldehyde and name the alcohol as a hydroxy group. Um in this case, there is a prefix for for a ketone, but I don't remember what it is, so I'd have to look that one up myself. Um, two functional groups on the same, and actually, I think our textbook has an entire appendix dedicated to how do you name compounds that have two functional groups, because there's like a priority list. Like carbo carboxylic acids and the acid derivatives are the most important thing, so they always get named at the end. But if you don't have a that then aldehydes are the next highest priority and then ketones are the next highest priority and then alcohols and so on and then it's, it has a list of all those things so um i would check that out if you had questions about that um lastly this last one is going to be an aromatic sorry an electrophilic aromatic substitution so a friedel crafts acylation so that would be we would start from That would be one of our reactants and a Lewis acid. All right. So we're almost out of time but there's one more mechanism to look at here. Um, and this is one we've seen before. This is basically a nucleophilic addition, right? We saw this when we first started talking about, in fact, I think this was on your review sheet. This was one of um, one of the reactions, the mechanisms um, on your, your final last quarter, right? Was if you have an, a, a nucleophile and a carbonyl, the carbon side of that nucleophile as a strong partial positive. And so down here, this is just showing that um, this is one of the things you can do with some of the calculations that we've been doing. 
is you can take all of the orbitals that your Hartree-Fock method calculates, and you can actually add them all up together to get an idea of where the electron density is, where the partial charges are. Um, and as you can see, there is a strong, the red is a partial positive and the blue is a partial negative. So this is a way of showing graphically what we already knew to be the case. Oxygen pulls electron density away from carbon. We can actually demonstrate that now with these calculation methods. Um, and so if you've got a strong partial positive on that carbonyl carbon and a strong partial negative on the carbonyl oxygen, if you have a strong nucleophile, it's going to be attracted right down there. And so what winds up happening is to make room for that, you need the oxygen needs to pull electrons towards itself and you get a alkoxy group. You wind up with an oxygen with a negative charge, which then steal a proton from any proton source around. So a nucleophilic addition, you just wind up with the nucleophile attaching to the carbonyl carbon and the, and the carbonyl oxygen gets turned into an OH group. All right, and we will pick up with that on Tuesday. And here's a, here's a key difference. In general, aldehydes are more reactive than ketones because they have a stronger partial positive. They only have one electron donating group attached to that carbonyl carbon. Aldehydes have, have more partial positive for that reason. Therefore, if we had a molecule like, like uh, was it E on the previous page, where you had a ketone on one side and you had an aldehyde on the other and you had to pick which of them was going to react, the aldehyde will react first. If you had enough, if you had two um, equivalents of your nucleophile, both of them will react eventually, but the aldehyde will react first. All right, so we will stop there a whole one minute early. Aren't you guys lucky? Um, and we will pick back up with nucleophilic addition on Tuesday. Um, don't forget to take the quiz this weekend and keep working on those calculations if you're still if you're still uh, fighting with the computer. Um, get those numbers, set up your potential energy surface. Let me know if you have any issues. All right. Everybody have a good weekend.